Hola! Kamusta? How are you, bro? Kamusta, ah, bro? Okay naman. Ito nga, kung nagkanto ko sa'yo kanina. Medyo stressfully. What's up, man? Man, What's going on? Muntik na ako manakawan, ako manakawan ng kotse. If you, if you drive a Kia or a Hyundai, apparently merong TikTok video na kumakalat na in-explain paano wag nakaw ng Kia at saka ng Hyundai using a USB stick. So, please, very, please be very careful. Kahit sa mga Pilipino, baka the next thing you know, nasa Banawi na yan and being sold for parts dahil nanakaw. Pero, you know, I don't know if I'm malas or lucky. Half malas, half lucky. Kasi hindi naman nanakaw. Sa tingin ko dahil ano, napansin nila na nakita sila ng kapitbahay ko. Pero grabe. Oh, wait lang, Lelo. Um, um, like, this is any Honda model or like models? To yeah, uh, apparently the newer, one, the newer ones pa nga kasi parang uh, hindi ko alam. Basta, tingnan nyo na lang yung ano, yung ano, yung... Hyundai and Kia Challenge. I-Google nyo yun. Yeah, you don't have to reveal um, what exactly you're trying. I just want to understand, no. like, is this like a hacking of the smart cars? Something like that? Parang hindi, hindi siya. Para, hindi, pero transmission pa rin kasi hindi naman electric yung car. Ah. Saka, hindi naman yung, hindi naman mamahal yung kotse ko. Pero anyway, it's a it's a fascinating story which maybe we can dis- discuss later. Ikaw, kamusta ka? <laughs> no, no, so yeah, I just came from Madrid, so I spent more than a week there in Madrid. So that was fantastic time. Oh, I, I got to walk where not only Rizal but also where Carlos Celdran uh, used to go. So it was a little right. bit, of, uh, uh, it, it was a little bit of let's say beyond nostalgic. You even have a sense of responsibility, right? Parang someone has to continue these things that the other great people were doing. I was very lucky to be with Manoleto. Uh, Paterno, who of course happens to be related to to the great Paterno, so we had a lot of discussions about Ilustrados, you know, uh, and that history. I felt really good. I, I think Spain gives me a lot of not only nostalgia but also a sense of future, but also it puts a lot of uh, our current contemporary major partners, foreign relations, into uh, perspective, which I, I I felt it's perfect to discuss with you as a historian no so i approach this as a political scientist ir person but you're definitely a historian here so i was thinking lelo is it for our latest nexus episodes since i think we're going to have a slight break of a few weeks before magellan junior uh, i mean marcus junior will go on his next circumnavigatory kasi alam ko nexus white house then elisi palas i was checking with the spanish like is there something in the books in madrid or something like that so Medyo, I think tapos na siya sa 9 or 10 visits niya within 7 to 8 months. So, while medyo may break tayo, can we reflect upon what happened here? In particular, of course, relations with the, let's say, the Troika, right? US, yes. China, and Japan, because Japan is very big. So, I, I felt, of course, first of all, since also you're based in the US, and US has been the most uh, influential uh, superpower in terms of shaping uh, the Philippines, uh, essentially trajectory and political institutions and foreign policy over the past six, seven decades. I just thought let's first start with uh, with the United States, and then the next episodes or sub episode, let's focus on China and then Japan. So I w- I was hoping Lelo will do it a less conspiracy theory version of Oliver Stone's kind of the secret history of right. So so what is the secret <laughs> history of Philippine and United States? Any more myths? Ano yung mga katotohanan? Saan tama si Tatay Digong? At saan hindi? Okay? Can we, can we go there, bro? Uh, sige. Uh, saan, tayo, saan, yung, saan, saan natin gusto magsimula ngayon? Gusto ba natin magsimula sa 1898, sa 1899? Um, I mean, you, you as a, a Filipino base in America, where, where do you think you should start in terms of explain to our fellow Filipinos and philo, Filipino-Americans who are also following us? If you want to explain America to the Filipinos, where do you want to begin? Like with Mayflower, with slavery, or what? With... Well, actually, di ba, parang, you know, one place you can begin, and I'm, I've been thinking about this, is is, is, the, is the 16th century, where right. um, Manila men on the galleons started to uh, go to California, California. which yes. technically was part of the U.S. yet at the time. So, you know, in, in many ways, nauna ang mga Pilipino dito sa California kumpara sa mga puti. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting side story. Pero yung, ano, yung sasabihin natin, I guess, um, nation to nation, or if you like, even state-to-state relationship between the Philippines and the United States begins really with uh, Emilio Aguinaldo in Hong Kong, of course, because Emilio Aguinaldo is in Hong Kong. Um, he's in, in Singapore, Exeter. right? And also in Singapore shortly, right? He Singapore, must... yeah, be, uh, because of the part of Bernardo Matrasha, and then you have right. the Spanish-American War, and, and as a result of the Spanish 
American war kung saan nag-away mga Amerikano at saka yung mga Kastila. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So Aguinaldo and, uh, uh, and the US um, get into conversations and Aguinaldo return, continues the Philippine Revolution in the Philippines because the, United, the, the Americans allow him to go back to the Philippines. And then of course after that, yung, yung betrayal of the Americans in the Treaty of Paris where they purchased the Philippines um, also, well, also Puerto mm -hmm. Rico and Cuba from Spain and then eventually in 1899, the first shots of the Philippine American American War are shot. And then of course, you know, it's very important for me as somebody working in the US that we label right. that war properly. Because in the US, the Philippine American War in Digma and Filipino America was initially labeled um the Philippine insurrection. Now, when you say inter insurrection, the bang assumption don't illegal. Yeah. I say like in January 6th insurrection, it is an illegal. Uh, re revolt against a duly constituted, a legally constituted authority. So when you say Philippine insurrection, ang assumption mo dun is hindi legal yung government ni Aguinaldo, um, which right. is, you know, offensive to Filipinos. And, or legitimate uh, yung mga Amerikano. Eh, or, and, and then legitimizes a kind of colonial occupation. So um, that that's kind of a bunk way of looking at it. And then contemporary historians, a lot of U.S. historians and even, you know, a lot of people in the U.S. call it the Asian part of the Spanish-American War, which mm -hmm. is very, very weird because who were the Spaniards fighting in that war? Sino yung mga namatay na Spaniards if it's part of the Spanish-American War? So, uh, Manuel Quezon? Yeah. Like, we're <laughs> you know, they, were para, this point, they were calling themselves Filipinos and were loyal to a Filipino state, not to Spain, right? right? Um, In fact, these were the same people who had rejected Spain. So why you call it, you know, the Asian part of the Spanish-American War? The reason why that's done is because in the words of historian Daniel Immerbar, the United States is trying to hide an empire. They're trying to hide an empire right. because the United an States empire. doesn't want to think of itself as a colonial power. And so has uh, and so it goes through these um, verbal linguistics in order to obscure the fact that they colonized the Philippines, that they're no different from the European powers they had criticized at the turn of the century. Right. Right. Yeah. So you know of course uh you know it's bathed in, and it's bathed in blood you know the the first moment the, the first interaction between filipinos Amer and americans really bathed in blood so we have various estimates as to how many people died in a population of 7 million to 8 million um so around the the low ball estimate is 300,000 this is from the state department yeah. to 1 million the right the estimate is from nationalist filipinos 1 million so you know both of these both of these groups of course have a kind of incentive to either lowball or highball it one the nationalist filipinos the other the state department but you know 300,000 or 1 million and that, I don't really care how big that's that's a lot of filipinos dead right because of regardless malaria, yeah. because of war because of famine and because of the actual fighting because of famine etc it's 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 a horrible number so it's a gruesome number so when we think about filipino american friendship it is i mean it is important to recognize that it begins with blood now does that mean we we can't rely on the U.S. for protection against China today. I mean, I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't think so. That's a, that's a different issue. This is just from a historian's perspective. Yeah, yeah we're just going step by step now. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Pedro, uh, like I, I just want to set the tone of the discussion. By the way, you said bago dumating mga pute, so you don't consider the Espanol pute. <laughs> it's like, what are they off white? <laughs> I mean, remember because uh, so, yeah. was part of Novo Espana, right? Or like, yeah, yeah. Oh, well. well <laughs> oh yeah, the before the mating yung mga yung mga Nordic, Brit, yung, yung mga yeah, ang, Nordic British, people, so. yeah, Anglo, yeah, ang, uh, Anglo-Saxon and Nordic people. Although I, I always joke, I would say like you know, Southern Europeans are more like Middle Eastern, right? They're more like Lebanese than you know, yeah. like English or all, no, yeah. Or white. Um, yeah, that, that, that's absolutely true. But of course, we also yeah, you have to also understand that uh, you know what was happening with the U.S. is there was a lot of domestic opposition. To the imperial project right no less than mark twain was involved in that he passionately wrote against yeah. the occupation of the philippines and let's not forget that uh what america did well in cuba was kind of uh not only as a form of uh you know martin all pero so the pretext for that was the sinking of an american warship yeah. no? uh, and, yeah. and americans used that kind of a I won't say false flag, but they kind of put themselves in a position to be almost shot, right? But and that's the thing yeah. of historians, yeah. Yeah, so, and, and then of course, it, it's at the center of presidential debates. 
So in yeah. 1900, um, si President William McKinley, who yeah. started the war, he encounters vigorous opposition from the Democratic Party under right. the guise of a Southern populist named William Jennings Bryan. Bryan. And if you look at the accounts from that period, the way they're talking about the Philippines is similar to the way they're talking about Iraq or yeah. Vietnam. Or Vietnam. It may be a central debate of those elections. Or Ukraine so, today, yeah. Or kind of yeah. So in other words, if you vote for the Democrat, you're voting against the war. If you vote for the Republican, you're voting for the war. So that that was um, William Jennings Bryan. But I, I I read some political science. Because so this will lead you to think that Americans are imperialists, right? So because yeah, yeah. they voted for McKinley, nonetheless. But I read some, actually, I read some political science accounts from around 1904 to 1910. There's an analysis at that time that actually Americans were not imperialists, but that they voted for McKinley out of class interests because McKinley right. was defending the interests of Northern money. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of people who did not like the war but voted for the Republican right. nonetheless because of class interests. So hindi daw malinaw na, you know, it was a, just a clear-cut right. referendum of war in the Philippines. But you know what, what we need to think about it, like it was a it was a super it was a central debate. In fact, sabi ni, sabi ni um William Jennings Bryan, um and I'm and paraphrasing here, he says, if you're against trust, if you're against the gold standard, and if you're against imperialism in the Philippines, then you are a Democrat. So you knew three you knew three main issues of the 1900 yes. election for him, three, three top issues. So ganun kasi, ganun ka central yung Pilipinas dun sa yeah. foreign policy debate ng US. And, and, it was the foreign Right. And and the idea of empire. No, I mean, this is what makes US and uh, Britain for that matter different, right, from other imperialist powers like Japan in uh in similar period or let's say China or Russia today, right? These are called liberal empires precisely because they have a domestic politics. It's a pretty open domestic politics and also yes. open ended in terms of political direction. No, later on we'll see at the advent of First World War with Woodrow Wilson also coming in. There's a lot of contentious domestic politics there, which you don't see in places like Russia, right? In Russia, I mean, yeah. we see generals falling off the windows. That's what we see. We don't see, you know, the Mark Twains and all coming out. If, you know, the closest thing they have to Mark Twain is now in a Siberian jail, right? So, yeah. so that's the difference. Because we always hear, ah, America, China, lahat naman yan, para sa hegemonic power. No, no, no. There's a one big difference. America is a democratic country with, with imperial, uh, you know, characteristics. But precisely because it has, it, it has domestic politics dynamics, it's much more... Let's say susceptible uh, to pacifist kind of movements. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and the, the, and alam mo, yeah. Alam mo the, the Filipinos knew this. Because if you look at yung sinasabi ng mga katipunero sa Cebu, for example, in 1899, ah, in 18, uh, in 1889 rather, sinasabi nila sa isa, isa hintay lang tayo, election lang ang kailan nating hintay. Uh, interesting. Sa very interesting. Because, very interesting. Because the Cebuan no so we, we i i can we can assume that the manilenos were thinking something similar but we we, we see the record at least with the ah, so we have evidence more of Cebu. Cebu. yeah by uh, by uh, si professor Rizil Mujares in sa kanyang libro ng bargain tell Cebu. me more no, i didn't know that uh. sorry I'm sorry there, the, 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 Cebuanos, yeah. the, the Cebuanos in 1889 were monitoring the US election kasi feel nila mananalo si Brian. So they were just, ang, ang plano nila was not actually to beat the Americans. Ang right. plano nila just to wait for the election. And dahil pag nanalo daw si Brian, exit na yung mga yan. Right. So right. they, so even the Filipinos were kind of aware of this democratic system in the US that, you know, in other words, that they could exploit. So, so totoo yan. Right. Which makes, eh, China doesn't have anything like that or Russia. Like, good luck with, yeah, 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 yeah. with Putin, you know, like, or, or Xi Jinping, right? Exactly, yeah. So the Ukrainians right now they, they can't rely on that. You're know, wait wait it out, wait for the for for Putin to get uh, to get voted out. It's not gonna happen. It's like happen. It, yeah, most you can like you know wait out a, a, an assassination attempt, but you know who knows. But it will make right? it worse. I mean, uh, the fear is if Putin goes, someone crazier even will take over. You see that? Sure. that that's a big difference. It, U.S. is an empire with an open political system. If I want to put it in the political science terms, right, which makes it very different, right? What journalists say, what foreign correspondents say, what foreign groups and lobbying groups say, like the book Israeli Lobby, right, talks about how pro-Israel uh, groups mm -hmm. in the U.S., like IPAC, 
play a very important role in influencing their foreign policy. You don't see any analog to that in, in authoritarian superpowers like China or Russia and others. So I just felt that was important. But thank you for pointing that out because my sense is the problem with a lot of the illustrado literature, late 19th century literature of the Philippines is very Luzon centric. No, uh, you know, it goes from Isabel, Isabel de los Reyes from the north the north of the north, all the way to, I don't know, people in Cavite, etc. You don't hear as many people as uh, from, from Visaya or the Mindanao perspective, right? So I was, uh, is, is, are there other people? Because if you look at the Nick Joaquin book, right, he's very critical of Aguinaldo. Essentially, his argument is that Aguinaldo was a very competent general, but a horrible diplomat, right, mm -hmm. and politician. That he, he was beating the Spanish on the ground thanks to all of these illustrados trained in advanced engineering in Belgium, the more developed countries of Europe, uh, trench warfare, nun palang ginagamit ng mga Pilipino, di ba, sila Alejandro, etc. Um, but uh, Evangelista, before he, he died during the uh, war, so you had all of these brilliant engineers who were very successful in beating the Spanish. But he, the, the term he used was native timorousness, which is like sobrang naive si sobrang ay brutal talaga si Nick Joaquin, right like sobrang naive si ano daw si si Aguinaldo na he thought the Americans were going to come in and help Philippines to liberate itself from Spain without anything in exchange i mean like like who who the who would think that way like it takes so much leap of naivete right for for you to do that so his argument was until the battle of manila actually the philippines could have won the war on its own right and there was also the Pedro Paterno aspect whereby Pedro Paterno was suggesting, why not make a united front with Madre España, whatever is left of Spain, which was already a crumbling empire, then we can maybe fight back the Americas. Anyways, regardless of the counterfactuals and those interesting things you're mentioning, I just found it interesting that you were saying there were actually a lot of illustrators who were actually very well informed. And the idea of information is important, Lele, because it also is connected to Rizal, right? Because one of the accusations against Rizal is that he didn't support Bonifacio's calls for revolution and the the argument, the dubious argument is that it's because he's reformist. But my understanding is that because he was in Dapitan, he was exiled, he was actually very not very well informed about the latest global affairs event. This is the Benedict Anderson. Yeah, kind of there are there are the sense that Rizal was against uh, the timing of the revolution, timing exactly uh, to the revolution itself, and we can get to this discussion. But he was already thinking that you needed J Japan. To, to have a successful revolution at the time. You mean so, to balance out the Yuma putting empires? Yeah, you needed the support of the Japanese. Yeah, yeah, like work with them again. Against and alam mo, alam mo, tama, tama naman si Rizal dun because, and, uh, because hindi rin naman successful si Bonifacio, di ba? He needed the Caviteños for his, for his revolution to have some sense of success. So, di ba, parang, ang tawag nga, yung, yung idea yung alsabalutan, uh, that, was, that was a word that the Cavitenos used to describe Bonifacio kasi puro talo siya sa Manila, mag-aalsa siya at magbabalot siya. So that, that insult that we use until today, yeah. Yeah. Ginamit, that was originally used for Andres Bonifacio and the Manila so had to flee to Cavite dahil puro talo sila sa Manila. And yung talo nila, yung interesting yung route nun. Yung route nun, di ba, is, is on Katipunan Avenue kasi yung bloody march paakyat into Balara. Uh, interesting. Is Katipunan now. Yun yung, dun sila umaatras eh. Oh. Yeah, that, that was a side. I know we're digressing a little bit, but I remember one of the first things I, I read from you was your, your attack on the so-called Diliman consensus, which is essentially this whole school of thought that valorizes Bonifacio in very interesting ways at the expense of Rizal. But actually what I'm saying is that why are we so even obsessed even with Rizal? Forget about Bonifacio. There are all other people who are contributing to the, you know, to the Filipino revolution. Many brilliant people, Evangelista, Alejandro, not to mention the Luna brothers. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I just find it fascinating, this whole Diliman consensus and this whole Rizal versus Bonifacio when the actual war was being fought by totally other people and with varying degrees of success. Yeah, and then, yeah, and then, of course, maraming versions of that Philippine revolution because... You know, meron ngang si Cebu, and then there was. Um, yeah, can you tell the, me about the Cebu one? I'm I'm so sorry. The I feel so, the 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 the, the, the who are considering setting right. up a cantonment or maybe even a federal republic, and then weird yung kanilang relationship with with Aguinaldo. And you know, the reason why there are many Philippine revolutions, including in Negros, including in Cebu, and then of course in later migration of the revolution northward, right. in, south into Sorsogon, for example. 
the reason why there are many revolutions is because yung 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 interaction nila with yung centro mahirap kasi yung communications on mahirap eh. so yeah, delay delay yeah. mga reports and then and then hindi rin naman malinaw from the perspective of the sina Aguinaldo what what really was this Philippines you know at this time ah, interesting yung weird yung thinking yung yung geography nila of what the Philippines were they were more likely, for example, to say that the Caroline Islands were part of the Philippines than they were to say Mindanao was part of the Philippines. So it was or kind Palawan. Of or Palawan. It, it was a kind of different geography. And it was a kind of wibbly wobbly idea of what the what the Philippines was at that time. So because this this was a this was an emergent an emergent nation, and we were really trying to figure things out. And then, of course, that emergent nation uh, to go back to the topic was aborted by by the United States. Diba? Parang pinutol niya yung, pinutol niya yung imagination na yun. And then it creates, a, it creates a kind of new society. <laughs> and, 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 I didn't intend to... Yeah, and, no pun intended. Push, but um, but no of course, push. the US, um, sorry again, in terms of umbilical cord, the US also did a major psychological uh, you know, damage to us in a sense that it made us essentially forget the Spanish language, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, we cannot even read and properly understand the originals, right? Like a yeah. lot, of, not a lot. Practically all illustrado writings are in Espanol, right? So yeah. I have to take advanced courses in Salamanca University to properly break it down. It's it's ridiculous the situation that we have, right? So we lost the language, even the mm -hmm. facility to 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 access the founding fathers' documents, right? I mean, actually, I. I I don't mind revisiting GMA's proposal. Naalala mo dati? Yes, yes. For, yes, yes, yes. I, I agree with that. With Tita Arroyo. Yeah. I don't mind, I don't mind that. Uh, I, her, I, Spanish, I, her Spanish is beautiful. And uh, actually, when you listen to Jim, side note, when you listen, maraming Filipinos para sila lang Doña Victorina kung magkastila. Yeah, major right? exaggerate. Major, yeah, that's Jimmy actually speaks Spanish with a Filipino accent. Like Hindi siya fa 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 fa. It's I I think it's a beautiful Spanish. It's right. it's her Spanish. It's a Spanish that that if taught to Filipinos will be understood. Right. Hiyang sa tingin natin. Yeah. So uh, sweet on us. I, I, I love I, I love the way Jimmy speaks Spanish. Uh, it's very Filipino. Jimmy is actually a very she's she's a polymath, right? She speaks Ilocano also very well. Of course, she's Kapangpangan. I mean. She's I, probably she's one of the smartest presidents we have had. No, I mean let's not talk about the ethical moral uh, aspect of this. I don't want to get into that. But of all top leaders, I I you know I talk to. I mean the you know Ramos also of course has been a good friend. But Roy was slightly intimidating when I interviewed her back in 2019. It's, right, I, I saw I saw that interview, Richard. Saw that interview, and I could, and you could see there was some air. Parang meron pang ano na napaatras ka ng konti, lalo hey, na sa Joe, ano, eh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, hey, there are hey, other hey. things I want to say, but off the record na lang yan. I mean, no, no, but uh, but rather, I mean, no, I keep it to myself na lang. Um, in all due respect to Tita Arroyo, di ba? No, she, was, she was very kind and respectful and all. I mean, I'll give credit to her. But I'll be honest, I think she was... I mean, it was like senior professor talking to a junior professor almost. Like sometimes the tone was like that. And it's like, no, you're not going to do that to me. I'm the journalist here. You're being interned. No, but I was, that was one of my tougher interviews, I would say. No, um, yeah. I'm one of my toughest interviews, Richard Chris Aquino. Anyway. Ibang challenge. Yeah, I am. Seryoso ko dyan. Hindi dahil mababaw, dahil matalino. But I'll get I'll get to that. I was intimidated by her intelligence. To to Dude, I'm so impressed by you. So you interviewed all the Tulfo brothers. You interviewed Chris Aquino. Wow, man. Like, you're the one. I feel my my toughest interview. Anyway, um, so issue Let's of language. Let's go back. Yeah, illustrados. Issue yeah. of language is actually very interesting because it's one of the reasons why so many illustrados supported the arrival, uh, the the American occupation. Now, uh, remember La Solidaridad, yung organ ng ng uh, illustrados of Spain. They had a couple of demands. One, they they demanded uh, secular education. Two, they demanded eventual representation in the Spanish courts. Right. And three, they demanded to be taught in Spanish. They demanded Filipinos be taught in Spanish so they could have access to Western knowledge. Now, what did the Americans offer? They offered secular education for everyone. They offered the teaching of a European language to everyone, English. Yeah. And then they offered, they they dangled the possibility of joining the union eventually, right? Um, right, right. That's why the first manifestation of Filipino support for the U.S. was the Federalista Party that wanted the Philippines to become a state of Spain. Now, what was that? 
that was essentially what the Ilustrados asked for from Spain. And then the United States was more open to giving that. Right, so right. that is why a lot of Ilustrados supported the Americans. It's it, it's because parang it's the old vision. It, they were offering what, what Spain couldn't offer. So this idea na traidor lahat ng mga Ilustrado, I, you know, Teodoro Agoncillo said that, you know, TH Padre Tavera deserved to be shot um, because of... Because because of yung collaboration niya. And then I remember Manong Frankie Shunil Jose said that the Araneta family should apologize for Gregorio Araneta jo joining the Federalista Party until today. Um, it, it's actually... Uh, and then, of course, yung General Luna film that, you know, is just essentially just calls all of these people yeah. people traitors. I mean, I I don't take on that view because this was... This is a... Agree or disagree, it's a, it's a, it's a view that's understandable from the context of that time, collaboration... And then, of course, here's the here's the big reason why we shouldn't necessarily condemn collaborators. Sabi ko nga, Richard, and dami ng patay on the battlefield. So to say that you wanted the killing to stop, you know, let's set up a government, a civilian government, because remember, at that time, it was a military occupation. These guys right. just wanted the military out. They wanted the civilian government to step in so that the fighting won't stop. And so right. for us to say, you know, things like, yeah, dapat binaril si TH Pardo Tavera, dapat si yung Araneta family mag-apologize for yung ginawa ni Gregorio Araneta joining the U.S., joining the U.S. occupation force. I think that's 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 really misinformed. I think there was a kind of pacifist argument um, for them collaborating with the Americans. Aren't a lot of these people making this argument also the same people that tend to be a little bit softer on Marcos later on, especially when Marcos was playing this nationalist card? I know we're jumping already, but I mean, there's Duterte. some sort of correlation. And later Duterte, no ma -ma, but you get what I'm saying? Let's not name names. I mean, some are actually people close to my heart, but... Like I noticed, like ah, uh -huh, so these are the people who take the hard line against the U.S., but later on they seem to be very soft on Marcos and especially Duterte because they're anti-U.S. Something like that. Like I, I found some weird thread of mm. continuity or pattern there. No, and I thought, the parang algorithm na yan na detect ko yan. Parang, mm, parang something is going on here, right? No, but before we jump to Marcos and all, because that's important. Marcos the father before going to Marcos the son. No, no, I mean this for me is interesting, but. I, you actually preempted me because my argument would be, I, I mean, I know that U.S. was offering what Spain was offering, but already the war happened, right? So yeah, oh, me, I mean, national identity. You know, you know, we have passed, we have crossed the line now. So maybe U.S. should have offered more. Now, what was what was this whole offer of independence to Philippines all about? I mean, because there are many hypotheses, right? One hypothesis is that uh, America realized it's not sustainable in colonial project. Probably it's too expensive. It's it's on. The other one was, um, you know, they just wanted to keep an illusion that one day they'll give independence to the Philippines while, you know, keeping it an open-ended relationship in that sense. So, so there are many versions of that. What is your reading of the whole independence game that Manuel Quezon was very much invested in for political, personal political uh, reasons also, aside from Patriot? Well, there are there are there domestic politics involved there because there were a significant Portion, there was a significant portion of the United States population that didn't want the Philippines to be part of, the, of America in the long term. And then, of course, young Republicans, they needed to justify what they were doing, right? Because the Republicans uh, still came from a, a, a country with an anti-imperialist tradition, right? right? Because the U.S. was a former colony, so they had to justify what, what they were doing. And they justified it by saying by saying that it was temporary, that it was like, right. it was tutelage. Now, pag naturoan at Mga, what they called uh, you know little brown brothers then they would set that country free and remember there was there was there was sign still significant pressure from the democratic party brianism right. was still a force of course yeah. when when wilson when wilson becomes president of the united states um that when the democrats finally beat the republicans and when Wilson Woodrow Wilson becomes president of the United States. Woodrow Wilson says that he that one of the principles he respects is the principle for eventual self determination of countries. Right. right? So that was that what is, that was, that was at the center of his internationalism. It was an ideology he, he largely borrowed from the Italian Mazzini. Um, and the Secretary of State yeah, was no less than William William Jennings Bryan who was the person who was the major advocate of Philippine independence early on. So there were domestic politics in the U.S. that, that made it such na kailangan mong sabihin na temporary yung stay mo right. sa Pilipinas. Even, even, yeah. even, us, even us in the Philippines, there were 
forces like the Federalista Party that wanted to join the Union. So, and daming domestic forces here right. in the Philippines, there in the, here in the United States and there in the Philippines that were kind of competing to, to create various narratives as to what the future of the Philippines would be. It's, it's kind of interesting thing. And, and what I want to say here is ito yung, ito yung problema when we talk international relations about the entire realist yeah. tradition of we assume na coherent yung mga bansa. Right. There's one US. Unitary. One, yeah, exactly. Yeah. They collide with each other. Interests collide with each other. But when you look at in domestic politics in the Philippines and the United States at that time, there were different Americas and different Philippines. Right. So, so in, in that sense, it's so it's so simplistic to say I anti-America. Yeah. There were so many Americas at that time. There were many visions of America at that time, and they were. We, we, we could tap into those traditions, even some of the beautiful parts of those traditions as Filipinos. Yeah, and speaking of Brian, I mean, we could have a whole podcast about uh, Brian Jones. I mean, he was a fascinating guy. I think he he crossed the Atlantic as a pilot, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, he was he was kind of like Trump and Sand, Bernie Sanders and all of them put in. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, he was mm-hmm. a fascinating the original, guy. Right? One of the original populists. The original populists, right? He kind of prefigured the populists of our era. But... Let's talk about the more interesting version also we had or as interesting person, which is General Luna. No, if you look at Antonio Luna, like there's one counterfactual argument that had he not been assassinated or murdered, whatever we want to call it, and he, we pushed ahead with the trench warfare strategy that he kind of was putting together from Cordillera, from where I was born. Uh, some would say that we could have inflicted so much pain on the Americans that this would have made it very difficult for the Republicans to withstand the domestic call for isolation and withdrawal, right? Like, of course, we couldn't defeat America on a one-to-one basis, but if we made it so bloody for them, as the Vietnamese would do later on, as the Taliban would do later on, then maybe they would have taught it twice and would have withdrawn eventually. What do you think about that? It I mean, have, uh, what, it yeah, bol- it would have, it would have bolstered the uh-huh. It would have bolstered Brian's Brian's uh, Brian's Candidate. electoral electoral <laughs> opposition to McKinley. Yeah, it's possible, but it's it's so hard to to think about those counterfactuals. There's a great piece um, by the late historian Glenn May called "Why the Philippines Lost the Philippine American War," and he says it's not a bad question to ask exactly. in the context of Vietnam because Vietnam was similar to the Philippines yeah, yeah. Um, fighting against a technologically superior force in their home turf, so pareho in terms. And yet they beat the Americans. So the question is, so in the obvious and not talo tayo, we could have actually yeah. won because the yeah. Vietnamese proved that we could won. We could have won. So so one factor that Glenn May says is we lost because ngayon hindi tayo guerrilla warfare. Dahil si Aguinaldo mayabang siya. He wanted yeah. set peace warfare. Yeah. Acho, yeah. He, he believed that was civilized. Um, yeah. Kasi insecure to si Aguinaldo, eh, may pagka prom di. Where, where si Antonio, Antonio Luna is like, Europe, you know, yeah. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm elite. You know, so if they call me a, a monkey because I engage in guerrilla warfare, so what? Diba? Pogi yeah. naman ako ng yung balbas ko. Diba? Ito ka nga doon ako sa mga itong mga rednecks na nandito. Uh, I mean, these uh, are uh, rednecks. Uh, so so yung, 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 yung ganun, wala siyang insecurity si Agu- da, wala siyang insecurity si Aguinaldo in that sense. Diba? So, um, uh, that's that's one, yeah. So so that's that's a possibility. But one of the other reasons why the Vietnamese lost is because uh, why the Vietnamese won was because of the body bag syndrome, diba? Kasi yung sinasabing body bag syndrome, may TV yeah, na time, yeah, may TV yeah. na time na yun eh. Uh, at nakikita ng mga Amerikano yung mga patay na Amerikano na mauwe through TV. Wala, walang access nun. And, and, and there was a student movement. I mean, just think about, I was thinking about this in my own campus, the University of California, Berkeley, during the Philippine, Philippine-American War, our campus was identified with that effort, right? We sent professors there. So Barrow, uh, Barrows, Moses, um, a lot of the people who would become prominent in our university were colonial officials in the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And yet, in Vietnam, you know, we were the hotbed of anti-Vietnam protests, right? Yeah. So, so there was really something different. Uh, in Vietnam, the opposition was a lot stronger, a lot better organized. And I mean, just the history of our campus kind of proves that. The kind of diametrically opposed response of our campus to both wars. You oh, okay? I, I just I I just love to stick to Tonya Luna. The whole the Luna people just amaze me. And at the same, of course, there there's a horrific side also to them. But but. What about the argument that had Luna succeeded, he would have ended up, let's say, the Ameri- uh, this is a situation. We make it so bloody. Uh, Brian James, uh, James Brown takes over in the U.S. Uh, Antonio Luna comes on top. But 
the idea is that he would he would have ended up more like Harry ng Luzon because most likely the Dutch would have moved on Mindanao, the British would have moved on Palawan, right? Uh, do, do you see mm-hmm. that kind of a balkanization of the Philippines as possible? Had we succeeded a la Vietnam against the Americans? Again, I know I'm stretching this, but I think it's so, worth so, taking into consideration. Yeah. So the Brit- so the British question is interesting. The Brit the, the British question it. it the question is what incentive did they have to actually make military entreaties into the philippines when 60% of our exports were already going to britain when they were when they had when most of the trading houses in the we're philippines already. were already governed by the britain we by, by the british we were already uh, an informal british colony at that time so their only reason to move against say you know a hypothetical would have been they had prevented free trade. Exactly. Exactly. Remember, the British had already obtained the majority of the free trade rights from the weak Spanish state at that mm-hmm. time, which really could not set up any opposition to their trading houses and to you know their intermediaries of Chinese businessmen in the Philippines. So, so yung British, I want to open question yan. The British at that time, at least if you look at the Anglo-Burmese war, they really go right. to war when their trading interests are challenged. So, so if a Luna government had challenged their trading interests, maybe. If yeah. not, if you allow them to keep those trading interests, go ahead. So and and you know it was very sobrang tibay ng British interest sa Pilipinas. Um, you know, for example, I saw an account from 1910. You know, 10 years after the Americans had occupied the Philippines, they were still writing, "How do we break up the British trading monopoly in the Philippines?" Ganon tayo, ganon tayo ka integrated into the Anglosphere in terms of trade at that time. Which, which is a product of the first Battle of Manila, really, no? During the Seven Years' War, which is even though the British left the Philippines after just a few years of occupation of Manila. Things were never the same, right? Uh, the because the Industrial Revolution na yan, right? And the, the the British will be involved here. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, Bonifacio ha, also had worked yeah. for a British company, right? So so Britain tends to be kind of a silent part of the imperial. Yeah, yeah. As the is concerned. It, it was part. So see, Takashi Shiraishi, he thinks about regionaliz- regionalization, and this might be this might be a good framework for what we're discussing. Regionalization in Southeast Asia in terms of three kind of three phases. The first phase is the phase that begins with Stanford Raffles in Singapore, wherein Britain right. comes in and forces effectively all of Southeast Asians to open up, uh, Southeast Asia to open up. And you create a kind of informal British trading empire in Southeast Asia that is based in right. Singapore in the Strait Settlement, but that extends into Batavia, into, into Luzon, into the port of Manila, right? And you see it in, into Cebu, right? And then you, you second phase of of course, especially, well, it begins in 1900, but it really solidifies after 1945 is the emergence of the United States as the major center for trade. And then he says, after the Plaza Accord, where eff- effectively uh, inappreciate mo yung Japanese yeah, and relative to the Southeast Asian currency so that the Japanese would be able to invest in Southeast Asia, right. you have effectively uh, kind of American dominance via and number two Japan and that's from 198 right. the 1980s until you know the ascendance of China so this is this is a kind of historical arc to look at the regionalization exactly. of Southeast Asia it's it's a it's a brilliant framework um, and I suggest uh, it's it's a highly recommended book in IR slash history it's called Empire of the Seas by Takashi Shiraishi the great right. uh, the, the, the Japan part of course is, has been much covered but I think the Britain part is not as much appreciated including the IR literature. Uh, thank you for that, Professor Claudio. No, I mean, no, I'm, I'm taking down notes because, you know, this is a very interesting, I want to go back to these discussions and I'm, I'm really, I'm almost getting obsessed about, you know, ito yung mga, ano, ito yung mga critical junctures in Philippine history, mm-hmm. right? Now, we move a little bit forward. Oh, yung British, something interesting, by the way. Yeah, favorite that's very so, The secret yung mana, history yung mana, of the US. Yung, has... yung, yung mana sa Manila, nagda-drive sila ng horse-drawn carriages. Yung mga, yung mga super from that time. According to the historian Michael Pante, they were already speaking English even before the arrival of the Americans. Dahil ganong karaming British businessmen yung dumarating. And then, uh, even in the Noli Metangere, you get an idea of how important the British yeah. are. Because right. in a city, si Piloso Potasio, he, he, he gets a bird and he wants to feed figure out where the bird goes. So he ties a message onto the feet of the so bird. Uh, and, and sabi niya, hindi niya alam saan pupunta. Hindi niya alam saan pupunta. Pero sabi niya kay Ibarra, sinulat ko sa English. I, I wrote it in English yeah, because so English is what is spoken in these parts. Right? So it gives you an idea of English is what is spoken at these parts. And this is before the arrival of the Americans. Very interesting. So I think that's 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 really the big thing in our secret history of U.S.-Philippine relations. 
is the fact that the British were already kumbaga, massaging and bulldozing the way, right? Uh, culturally, intellectually, and commercially, right? In, in many ways. So once the U.S. Come, comes, they're more like, they're like the more uh, provincial version of Britain, right? <laughs> it's like yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. <laughs> you know that, Rugged oh. version of British here, no? <laughs> Saka, interesting yung strategy ng, yung, yung, yung imperial strategy ng US was they wanted everyone in 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 the gold standard. So they wanted okay. to change the Philippine currency from silver into gold. Kasi yung currency nila sa US was gold. Uh, but the British actually had a very interesting system. They created a silver region in Southeast Asia. Mm-hmm. But they but they themselves were, dome- yung domestic currency nila was in gold. So right. what effectively that did was if you created a trading network in Southeast Asia that was exporting in silver and you were buying that in gold, mura yung, mas mahal yung ginto kaysa sa pilak, di ba? Mura yung bili mo. So you already created you your own... Their you effectively depreciated them, created an import market for yourself and an export market for these people. And uh, and that, that, that meant that you had really cheap raw materials coming into Britain all the time. So that the biggest debate, for example, between the Americans who arrived in the Philippines and the British bankers who were controlling our currency, right. and the issue of currency in the Philippines at that time was H, are pr- practically our central bank in 1908. Was uh, run in 1908. Was yeah. HS, HS, HSBC. HSBC. Yeah. You know, our your local, your international local bank. Yeah, that was practically our central bank at that time. And the biggest argument of HSBC against the Americans was, let us continue to issue silver in the Philippines and the Americans didn't want that. Yeah, yeah. So that was the other version of Plaza Accord, no? Yung mga forced negotiation, <laughs> right? Oh, you get it, oh, no? oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Tayo may... That's fascinating because, of course, one of the amazing things uh, that happened in this era was the more or less peaceful transition in hegemonic power, right? Which is mm. quite unprecedented in history. Usually, the shift from one hegemonic power to the other tends to be very violent and aggressive, right? But the transition from UK uh, to US from Southeast Asia and you know Latin America to much of the world. That was a relatively peaceful transition. And of course, in, in, in IR theory, there's a lot of discussion about that, but probably a different episode. Now, let's move a little bit forward. So you, you, not, actually, yeah. in the Philippines, it's at the forefront of that. Diba? Yung shift of, diba? The shift from British hegemony to US hegemony really, re- really becomes solidified the in, the post, in the post-war period. Diba? But you already get a kind of foreshadowing Point, yeah. of that in the Philippines the British capital being slowly taken over by American capital in right. the Philippines hegemon and peacefully kind of peacefully yeah and so the term is hegemonic transition so that's very fascinating. yeah yeah and in the I Philippines like it's it's con- it's really you know constituted by um it really happens through correspondences between bankers and the US military right. and I've actually tracked those current correspondences it's it's a very fascinating kind of micro you example want to write something on that after this episode I, I am I am writing like it's part of this book that I'm working on so oh, looking years, yeah. forward so you should thank me for helping you to give a preview of that as 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 this is interesting so in in some ways you can say the philippines was at the frontier of this hegemonic transition relatively peaceful transition in commercial and financial power and later on comprehensive hegemonic power. And now related to what we're going to discuss next, the Philippines also, a lot of historians would argue, was at the forefront of the birth of America's counterinsurgency strategy, which would later on be very much used in Vietnam, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, so on and so forth. And obviously now we're moving a little bit to the debate. The, the, this is a time of Magsaysay, right? As defense minister and, of course, the, you know, the counterparts in CIA, among others, who were helping him this, right? Do uh, you want to talk about that? I mean, uh, yeah. Oh, no, well, I, well, I, I well yeah, let's... Yeah, yeah. Yung, yung trabaho ni Paul Kramer, diba, uh, on the right. Philippine-American war shows that a lot of yung mga torture mechanisms, yung mga torture methods na ginamit eventually ng US sa Vietnam and then sa, sa Iraq. Iraq were started in the Philippines. A lot of it taken from the, from the Spaniards. Like, for example, yung idea of concentration or reconcentration yung tinatanggalin mo yung mga tao from their livelihoods and hey, then primavera yata yun di ba he was doing it also uh, Valeriano Whaler who was yeah 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 uh, sorry Whaler yeah the German sorry sorry the Germanic the Cuba, German, Cuba yeah. in the Philippines and then you know yeah. eventually in Cuba becomes, and, yeah concentration yeah. concentration yeah. and then yeah. yung German the most perverse version of of course the German version yung concentration camp yeah, yeah. um so so there there's that history and then of course uh, yung uh, uh fast forward uh uh, you know, 50 years, 60 years, uh, magsaysay and yung 
counter yung ops nila uh, yeah. ng CIA against the the Hook Hook. Rebellion, yeah. which they try to again bring to Vietnam um, other under the leadership of yung Southern Vietnamese President uh, Ngo Dinh Diem. Um, so that's that's that 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 that's that that's definitely another history that we can talk about, and it and it's a dark history. But yeah. um, and Magsay Say, of course, there's a dark element there. Pero yung part of those the part of that counterinsurgency was of course increased social spending. Yep. Napakalinaw na Magsaysay was um one the first post-war expansionist in terms of spending it, sa Pilipinas. Control, he, yeah. He, yeah. he really expanded the the money supply um and as you're commenting on that I'm actually going to look up the numbers because I have the numbers. Yeah. I was just in fact writing about it about how much magsaysay spent relative to relative to others and then how much the interesting thing here is how much garcia actually pulled back on that spending creating significant unemployment after the magsaysay regime so it was keynesian in a sense yeah kind of a, a, a er, kind of early early keynesian but i have the numbers your dirigist or kind of a dirigist yeah, well yeah but well, our first dirigist was really osmeña pero right wala namang ganong kapangyarihan si Osmeño dahil may Amerikano pa noong panahon na yun. Pero si Magsaysay talaga ang dami niya nag So Manuel Quezon, he didn't have that side to him? Sorry, I, I'm rewinding. Si, meron, si, meron, si, meron si Quezon. Pero if we're talking about who the first first one is, nauna si Osmeño. And no then si Nabaya Quezon. Oh. Kasi Osmeño was already advocating for it nung nasa legislature pa lang sila. Eh. Medyo big spender na si Osmeño even at that time. Okay, so here, here, here are the numbers for Magsaysay. From 1954 to 1957, the money supply increased by 9.2%. Mm-hmm. And you know, the interesting thing is inflation never went above uh, 2%. There we go. The, yeah. uh, <laughs> even, even, inflation. Even, even oh, no. despite the spending, and yet, and yet, Central Bank Governor Quaderno, that asshole, claimed that Magsay Sky was an inflationary president. He wasn't. Yeah, wala pa kasi yung mga alam mo na yung mga ganun na tao noon so there was time for stage I'm so sorry for for rewinding it slightly because I skipped someone very important Manuel Quezon I'm sorry before going to Magsaysay I mean we already touched on him a little bit but Manuel Quezon how do you see him because many would argue that Manuel Quezon could have been our first mo- modern Codillo right had he had his oh. way right he would have been the first I mean, he would be something between, uh, maybe Franco would be a bit too much, but kind of like a Latin American style Codillo and also something like Jawaharlal Nehru. He'll have this kind of finesse and probably post-colonial rhetoric and all of that. I mean, had he not died... Or, you and, been, uh, or, or, or uh, Sukarno, right? Uh, yeah, Sukarno. Yeah. All, yeah, all the Sukarno are a bit too colorful for my taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah but uh, way, I yeah. think, you know, uh, you know, Duterte, Sukarno, Quezon, these were people who loved talking about their privates. Right, but but in fairness to Milo Quezon, I mean, he was a charming guy, well-dressed and all of that, you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's this... Meron daw, meron daw, meron daw, meron daw, meron daw, there's this, I don't know if it's apocryphal, but, you know, it comes from a student of Teodoro Agoncillo who said that Teodoro Agoncillo would tell this story all the time to his classes. Now, alam mo yung, whenever, whenever a new, we see this, we see these steps in Malacanang, diba? whenever a new president... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they will be met by the outgoing president dun sa taas. Right. So, so yun, those are very, very steep set of stairs. Apparently, uh, what Quezon would do was he would order the American governor general to visit him in Malacanang. I don't know kung, uh, during or, or wherever he was, kung Malacanang ba yun. Um, and he would be on top of the steps. Although, actually, come to think of it, this might be apocryphal because Malacanang, because yeah, governor general. I'm suddenly seeing hey. gaps. The story. But anyway, the, but anyway, the story goes that <laughs> Manuel Quezon da would wait on top uh, of the stairs for Leonard Wood. Pag pinapatawag right. sa opisina niya, and he would wear a robe. Tapos wala daw underwear si Manuel Quezon. Oh. Para pag paakyat daw si Leonard Wood, makikita daw niya kung gaano katindi ang wo- Ay, robe. Ay nako. I, I think Manuel, that's it. I think that's totally yan, bro. I think that's all it's, bro. <laughs> hindi ko alam. Hindi He's ko short alam. Guy, right? He was a pero yung pero guy. yung 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 origins ng kwento na yun ay may estudyante si Teodoro Agoncillo na sinabi na yun daw ang kwento niya. I know, ni sorry Teodoro. Lord for for I know, <laughs> irreverent. I know, tayo mo si Manolo Quezon baka he can help you on that. 
Um, so yeah, I think a little bit naging too spicy Manuel Quezon natin. So going back to Magsaysay, what's up there? I mean, I mean, for a lot of Filipinos, Magsaysay was, you know, probably the best president we had. I mean, I don't know. We can argue it. We can slice the salam in many ways. What is your... I don't want you to use judgment. What's your assessment of the Magsaysay and his legacy and his transition from defense minister to president? Oh, of course, and his tragic, early tragic death. I mean, what what is... How do you, where do you place Magsaysay in Philippine history? And does he have a place in your heart, in your historian's heart? I don't know how. Yes, to... for me because he's the he's the biggest spender. He's the he's a, uh-huh. he's a kind of okay. so he's yes, a kind yes. of auto And then you know I have a one of my heroes in Philippine history is of course he Salvador Araneta, right, um, who right. wanted to who wanted full employment, wanted to depreciate the peso, and who wanted to spend a lot on social services, kind of like the first Filipino Christian Democrats, a social Democrat. Right. And Araneta, uh, well, Araneta loved Magsaysay. Uh, it's very telling that if you read uh-huh. the memoirs of Araneta, that he has nothing but good things to say about Magsaysay. And then if you read the memoirs of Miguel Cuaderno, my, one of the people I hate the most in Philippine history, he has nasty things to say about Magsaysay. So uh-huh. for me, uh, so for me uh, and um he really empowered the National Economic Council, which was the NEDA of that period, um, to create a bold spending plan for the Philippines. Right. And um, in, legislature, in, in his legislat- le- legislation, he allowed the Philippine government to issue more bonds, for example, than the central bank would have allowed. And that allowed him to boost spending by 9.2%. During during the Magsaysa administration, uh, without significantly increasing inflation, so I think inflation at that time was probably at a one point eight. My God, if we had one point yeah. eight inflation today, that, that with kinda, that kind of spending level, para medyo, medyo parang medyo parang like better than Pinoy if you think about it, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was three to four percent almost. At yeah, time. yeah. While expanding the money supply that significantly, and we we can talk about why that. And then, of course, the effect on was to to boost uh, to boost manufacturing, right? Um, right. Which is of course, and then of course, the 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 approach uh, sa, approach to labor unions under the Quirino administration. You had the Secretary of Labor who was also who was effectively uh, delegitimizing unions, uh, delisting unions that right. were not under. That were not allied to him, right? And 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 not to me, Gillian, under Magsaysay, yung kind of kind mm-hmm. of industrial repression. The, he started to implement uh, a, a a law that that um well the law the law was passed before it was president pero siya implement that uh, that allowed for an increase in union registration across the country, uh, and then you had an increase. But in, he was almost um, a social democrat, right? I mean, my in, in that. In, Mm-hmm. Yeah, in that sense, and then of course, yung yung ano yung uh, and then yung as a result, then tumaas actually ang share ng ma- tumaas ang manufacturing growth, and so the problem with Magsaysay is na na udlot yung yung spending nayon dahil si Garcia naging president and in his first year he declares an austerity program. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So we remember Garcia for first, the policy first, of Filipino yeah, yeah. first. And we think he's some great nationalist because of it. But he actually stemmed the tide of spending right. that began in Mag- Magsaysay because he listened to that asshole in the central bank, Miguel Coderno, who th- who scared him and said that there would be runaway inflation if he, c- he continued the spending policies of Magsaysay. He was a lawyer, right? Si Garcia? I'm yeah. not sure. Was he a lawyer or something? Mm-hmm. Well, maybe that makes sense. I mean, like, like the thing with like Magsaysay and these people is that they're much more flexible on orthodox in thinking. Mm-hmm. Right? I mean, look at the successful uh, developmental states. Almost mm-hmm. all of them were ruled by non-lawyers, right? People with oh, yeah. backgrounds, Sundalo, Park Chung Hee, etc. You know, people who had much more flexibility and actually smarter, wiser people. Hindi sila yung mechanistic yung thinking. I mean, no offense to the lawyers, but I see a lot of parallels between lawyerly thinking and kind of orthodox economic thinking. Both of them have very mechanistic, narrow-minded understanding of operations of state and governance, unlike yung mga more, you know, unorthodox ones. So, I, this is so. Had Mark Magsaysay not died and had he more time, you think he would have left a major legacy for the Philippines? Because the um, problem uh, in the 1950s was it was still a very import driven growth, it was not still that much manufacturing driven like a lot of the emerging developmental states. So, kaya nga unsustainable na siya. Kaya by 1960s, medyo malabo na yung situation natin by the time of uh, the Mahapagal, diba? So, so. 
counterfactual again. Had magsay say had more time. Hindi ko alam. Hindi ko rin alam kasi on the on the year of his death, he he issued a speech saying na tama si Governor Cuaderno. So nag ah so he was already. This actually forced the resignation. This actually forced the resignation of Araneta from the cabinet. Um, on the on on his last year. So much so that again, Cuaderno brags in his memoir. He says, "I finally won over magsay say," which is like. Oh man, but who knows? You know, parang how how long would he have won him over? Would he have had a chance to? Would would the opponents of um uh, of the central bank would they have had a chance to reassert their power, right. their 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 yeah, in, yeah. in a second magsaysay term? Because I think what happened here was the reason why magsaysay flipped over to the Quaderno side towards the end and became a fiscal conservative was because malapit na yung election. And right. la, pag may election sa Pilipinas, meron talagang inflation. Di ba? Kasi inflationary election sa Pilipinas ay maraming spending. Right, of course. So yeah. Probably, yeah. Was, he, was, he was guarding against that possible inflation. So at least before an election, you become a fiscal uh, so conservative. So it was a tactical. But there's a chance that if he won... May, so ano na lang to? Kuro-kuro na lang to, di ba? But there was a chance that if he had won a second term and di na niya kailangan tumakbo again, di ba? Right. That he, in fact, he would have been even bold, bolder. Bolder, yeah. right? Go and then... Ahead. You know, Paderno, shut, shut the fuck up. You know, get out of the way. Yeah. I'm spending, man. I'm I'm doing. I'm leaving a legacy. So who knows? That that's a fascinating way of look at it. Of course, I want to jump next, Kaga, to Marcos. I'm sorry to the other presidents, but let's slightly talk about Makapagal because I think Makapagal is an underappreciated president. I'm not saying this because Tatay Shani Arroyo, whom we kind of talked about, uh, Kanina, in not purely negative ways. Um, what do you think of Makapagal? If I'm not mistaken, I mean. Uh, Tita Arroyo. Like President Arroyo told me that her father actually had a PhD also in economics or something like that. I didn't know about it. I knew he was a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. He had an advanced degree in economics. So he said, my father was a lawyer economist, one of the first lawyer economists and all. But what is your understanding? Because he depreciated our currency, right? Wasn't he? A yeah. Yeah. He 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 was the fine, he was the guy who finally edged out this asshole Quaderno from, from the from the from the from the from from, from the heights of policy making. The right. most damaging and Quaderno really the most for me the most damaging figure right. in economic history of all time. Um, so for for that you know hallelujah. Um, and in in a way you know kind of response to the the, the unsustainability of yung nangyayari under the Garcia period, which is you know, under the Garcia period what what you had was protection of certain industrialists right. and that of created a lot of rent seeking. A black market for currency because of the unsustainable currency peg, right? And and as a result of that, um, because you were using the currency peg to provide dollars to certain favored industries, you did not get the emergence of a sustainable and solid industrial class, right? You only right, right. you got the emergence of people of an industrial class that was effectively supported by do- dollar su- dollar subsidies uh, and this of course went to high gear under the Garcia administration and because they they were not necessarily the most competitive industries even if you had certain industries growing in Manila at that time right. now that um, unemployment is not being resolved because they were not expanding to the extent na they could employ more Filipinos right. um, we don't very unclear yung ating um, underemployment data from that time, but it seems clear also that underemployment was a big problem at that time. And the only person who actually responded to that was, again, Magsaysay, who, who created spending that was creating some momentum in the employment sphere, but it was too short, right? And then, of course, na udlot yun by the austerity program of Garcia. Uh, and the, and so, so some of that gets reversed under Makapagal. Um, to what extent it's reversed? I, I, I I'll be honest, Richard. Di ko pa naaral. Ang naaral ko actually na transition is na mag magsaysay Garcia transition, right. which is a nasty, which was a nasty transition. Um, but I think that some of it is reversed under under um under Makapagal. So what essentially I'm saying here is that Garcia is Garcia really needs to be reassessed as a particularly bad president economically. Yeah, obviously, we're, our topic is still secret history uh, with the U.S., right? So what's up with the U.S. during that time? I mean, are they tolerant with us? I mean, obviously, the Americans were still enjoying uh, privileged access to the Philippines. They were still not very open to our exports. We're not really treated well in terms by the Americans. No? I mean, yeah. what, what so, so, we so yung, no, yung economic, yung economic policy ng Pilipinas was essentially um, was, was based on a... a 
a sort uh, uh, sir, um the Bell Trade Act and then eventually and the the Laurel Langley Trade Act. Yeah. Now the the Bell Trade Act. Um. Uh, so 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 initially, um, that meant under those trade acts, the Americans had uh what, what do you call this um parity rights in the Philippines. Right. Uh, so they American investors in the Philippines Definitely like get, Philippine citizens. get treated like Filipinos. Yeah. Now, now there's an entire nationalist tradition in Philippine economy, economics, and of course this begins with Recto, and then this gets passed on to Alejandro Lichauco, and then via Lichauco and Recto it gets passed on to the Communist Party of the Philippines and the the broader right. national democratic movement, and they place the ills of our country in this in this provision that gives parity rights to Americans right. in the Philippines, um, dial down the displace you mga Filipino industrialists as a result of that. The problem with that is that it's not very clear na napakalaki ng capital concentration ng mga Amerikano sa Philippines. If you look at the work of Oli Corpus, mm -hmm. hindi sobrang laki ng, ng concentration ng, ng capital. Actually, uh, the most, the, yung pinakamalaking abuse na ginawa ng mga Amerikano na sa atin at that time was that the treaty agreement prevented us from having our own independent currency policy. Yes. And in fact, um, the, the, econo the economy, the Cornell economist at that time, Frank Golay said, you know, while everybody is paying attention to parity rights, they don't right. realize that the greater violation of our sovereignty is the fact that the Americans did not allow us to set our own currency rate. Just like the 90s. British during the Spanish oh, era. So, so 10 years yon, 1945 until I think 19, 1955 or 1954, we right. couldn't set our own currency. So we we so in impose sa atin yung two yeah, is to one. So a lot of people think two is to one is a source of pride. Actually, it's a vestige of imperialism. Right. The Americans the Americans imposed uh, um Congressman Jasper Bell explicitly said that he wanted to protect um America that, that he wanted to protect. American importers. So he effectively imposed a strong currency on the Philippines under the Bell Trade Act. Right? Interesting. So we, explain, napaka, wala napaka tayong explain. monetary sovereignty. Yeah, that was a big one. Monetary, monetary. explicit niyan. Jasper Bell said that he was protecting American interests when he imposed 2 is to 1. So everybody who has pride in 2 is to 1, that's an imperial that's a that's yeah. an imperial vestige. And, and, and then of course in 19 when an expiring Bell Trade Act that was replaced by La the Laurel Langley Act 1954-1955, this idiot Quaderno finally has currency sovereignty. You know what he does? Nothing. He keeps the currency peg na ginusto na mga Amerikano even if he's no longer treaty bound to do so. So he's a perfect proxy. Uh -huh. Um now let's go to Marcos. I think we, first I mean the the senior Marcos What's up with Marcos and the U.S.? What's going on here? Because, of course, the caricature of Marcos is Marcos Tutan ng America. At the same time, you have this whole literature that shows Marcos was actually quite an interesting guy, I would say, on the foreign policy front, please. No? Uh, I mean, of course, we're all against the human rights violations, the horrible things he did domestically, including on economics. I have some serious problems with him, uh, with the whole technocrats that we brought in. I mean, we can debate about that. But on foreign policy... He seems to have he seems to have had a pretty decent approach to to America, making sure we get what we need from America in terms of strategic rents, in terms of some sort of basic deterrence. But at the same time, he was reaching out to the Russians via Partido Comunista. At the same time, remnants. At I, the same I, time. I will completely defer to you on this issue, Richard. Ikaw yung ikaw ang right. ikaw ang major influence sa thinking ko on this issue, particularly nung nung in interview kita. Yeah. Um, that, oh yeah, uh, yeah, we did that. Oh uh, yeah, by the uh, way, uh, your, your uh, other uh, issue, and you, you, in fact, were saying that if we were to think about a potential blueprint for independent foreign policy, right. some of it can be found in Marcosian thinking, and you know, in particular through his foreign minister, see Carlos yeah. Piron, another person that I, I really you admire. Offered, right? Yeah, in your book, yeah, yeah fantastic. Or yeah, yeah, I mean, because my essentially my argument is that. Uh, you know, if you look at the foreign policy front, he was a much more nimble leader, and he was closest to what we understand as multi-vector foreign policy, you know, or or asymmetrical multi-front balancing, which is uh, sorry for all these jargons we use in international relations, political science. But, but for me, that that would, could have been a good foot, uh, you know, kind of a blueprint for the sun, and I think the sun is following that so far. That's why studying the father allowed me to more or less predict where the sun is today, which we'll skip to quite soon. But but. But speaking of Marcos, like, what is your what is your understanding of Marcos in terms of like what is there in Marcos U.S. relations that you, as a historian, believe is is not as much appreciated? 
you know like if, in terms of like secret history of Marcos and you ah uh, ah uh, uh, okay okay so Let's so sa like akin ah uh, kasi and sa akin this uh there is a if, if you read the uh, autobiography ni Christopher Hitchens no 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 not fully but I've heard great things about it yeah, oh, yeah. so it's I I highly recommend it so anyway the Imelda Trump we know that, we know that. that Christopher Hitchens eventually becomes close to the foreign policy establishment the neocons because he supports right. the war in Iraq right? so when Paul Wolfowitz is the defense secretary of George Bush yeah, yeah. Which being a world bank yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. according to Christopher Hitchens he he enters Paul Wolfowitz's office and in the mantle in the mantle of Paul Wolfowitz's <laughs> office the pride of place there's a picture of him whispering something to Ronald Reagan Right. So Hitchens goes, um, Secretary Wolfowitz, what are you doing there? Right. And why why does it have pride of place? And Wolfowitz says, it's the most important, it's one of the it's the most important picture in my career because that was the moment I convinced President Reagan to withdraw support from that from dictator. From from mm-hmm. So 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 what does that tell you? That tells you, I mean, Paul Wolfowitz is your neocon, but the person who believes that the United States that should protect thing. the world against dictators. Yeah. That The fact that that has pride of place tells you something, that possibly the birth of the neocon movement is... So, so in, the Philippines is a third front also. Like, oh, oh, yeah. kasi, I kasi, know because neo neocon is the opposite of containment, right? Containment right. Uh, containment means that you will contain communist it's countries right. by supporting anyone who is anti-communist, including dictators. Whereas the neocon movement is we hate dictators, we'll go to war with them. And in fact, you, the shift if if it, because Paul Paul Wolfowitz, you know, loved that moment so much, that means that's the neocon shift. That was the moment when the United States says, you know, we're done supporting dictators, even if they're anti-communists. And then, of course, your logical conclusion on this, you know, we need to protect the world from dictators. And so, so just the fact that Paul Wolfowitz thinks that that moment is so important already tells you something about the birth of the neocon movement. I mean, how do you react to that, Richard? But, you know, for me, I'm already writing a book in my mind, uh, which is The Secret History of the Philippines, right? Uh, like, uh, in uh, so many ways, the Philippines is so important to, uh, you know, the architecture of American hegemony over the past hundred years that is completely underappreciated. I know there's some fantastic books by some of our friends from MIT, among others, have written about Philippines on the front line. But what I'm getting really from this con- uh, conversation is a confirmation of like, how the Philippines has been central to America's global empire project in ways that has totally not been appreciated. Like, all we know is that once upon a time, the Philippines was a Commonwealth colony and it became a protectorate, more or less, right? I, I really I really like that. Kaya nga biglang na-curious ako. Now, with Christopher Hitchens, it's because I, I was really turned off by his uber-atheist comments and all, but he was really, really a smart guy and some of the things he said were very interesting. I mean, I like how he attacked Pinochet and all of those, you know, Friedman people and all. I appreciate that about him. But you're right. Uh, I have to check that out. Now, one thing I found interesting with your observations is the the whole Manfort, you know, like con artists, campaigners of Trump who are kind of connected to Marcos, right? This is the other secret history, right? A lot of people in the Trump political campaigning pseudo scammer circles kind of overlap, right? With people who are yes. there. This is another yes. secret history I want to talk about with you. Yeah. Yes, so so see Paul Manafort who becomes the campaign manager of Trump. He is the unofficial campaign manager of Apolakai in 1995- Exactly. So we're again 60. also the birth of the Trumpian campaigning mm-hmm. strategy, right? Oh, oh. <laughs> and so it has been it has been speculated that you make America great again might have come from Manafort who knew that Marcos's campaign tagline was, you know, you, you making the Philippines great. Um this country can be great again. Maga. So so possi- that's that's a complete possibility that we that Manafort, even yeah. Maga came from us via Manafort. But exactly. there's a report from Time Magazine na hanap ko na parang ano daw si Manafort nung 85 daw or 85-86 nakatambay sa airport ng Pilipinas hinihintay daw dumating yung mga American journalists kasi yung tanong sa kanila how much do you think my boss needs to win by to make it believable? Yeah, yeah like <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> Yan ang tawag na focus group discussion. Oh. <laughs> Obviously not sa dumb level or like Kim Jong-un oh. level of 99%. Right? Maya ka naman. 87, 80. I think I, I would call it the Mubarak level. I think Mubarak oh. later on. Oh. This, is, this is interesting. So th- there's the Trump connection, right? There's the neocon connection, right? Again, these are not talked about at all, right? It's all about he's an evil or he's great, right? 
What about and these uh, are fundamental currents, fundamental currents in American history, like in global important. history, in oh. global history for that matter. I, I'm sure if Adam Tooze would hear it, who would love it? Maybe I'll tag him on Twitter. Hey, did you oh. have to check this out? Put it in your podcast and all the secret. I'm already writing it, Secret History of uh, of the Philippines, right? I, I'm going to talk about all of these crazy things. This is fascinating. So thank you so much for confirming a lot of these sensibilities and also adding to my knowledge here. What else do you think is is not understood in terms of our relations with U.S.? What about this basing game? This uh, extend the base, give them the base, etc. You know, was Marcos properly juicing out the Americans in your opinion? Oh, yung, I mean, the key book here is still yung Raymond yeah. Bonner classic, yung waltzing right. with the dictator. Yung essentially, right. you know, Marcos could get away with anything. Like, even even with Carter, Carter came in and said, you know, the priority right. of the United yeah. States is human rights. Wala, wala siya magawa kay Marcos because Marcos would just say, you need my basis? Exactly. You play ball with me. And you can imagine okay, why, dog, why, yeah. Subic, why Subic is more import, is so important for the Americans because Subic is so large. I mean, Subic is, yeah. I think, roughly the size of Quezon City. It's definitely bigger than Singapore, right? Oh, yeah. So if you're oh, really yeah. like, you have, you have a place that's the size of a, if a, of a city, you have, you, you, ganun kalaki yung hawak mo na territory. So that's, that's how important it is. And the biggest and overseas military base yeah. for the U.S. Biggest ever outside continental U.S., of course, yeah? Oh. So it's it's just incredible when you think about it, no? Uh, how important the Philippines and how we juiced it out, which I think was a playbook also for Tatay Digong, no? I mean, let's fast forward. Sorry to three, four presidents out there. Maybe we'll talk about them under a different episode. Now, this brings us to Digong, right? Fast forward to Digong. Don't you think Digong learned a lot from Marcos Sr. on how to leverage the Philippines' real estate, essentially, uh, to to withhold, I mean, to to protect his own interest and protect himself from any sorts of conflict? Yung doon, Richard, saan mo, sa tingin mo nang galing yung instinct na yun? Galing ba yung kay Marcos? O galing yun dun sa kanyang experience ng local politics? and Or galing din sa kanyang sensibility where he's, He really likes to play groups against each other, diba? And and parang yes. serve as a kind it's, of... It's, it's, let's call it Stalinist of... instinct, right? It's <laughs> the Stalinist instinct. So one of the things that fascinated me when I was writing the book about Duterte non was I was reading like his former chief of staff or someone in in in, in the Davao, the Davao of mayor office. I think she's now in San Francisco or something like that, maybe not far away. She was something like... He, parang meron daw si Duterte yung style na... Alam yung parang ano... You, um, He will spread false rumors and see if if this goes out, then you know who you know who got the idea out. You know, yeah, he will do this test and then he wants to see his lieutenants fighting among each other. So very uh-huh. Stalinist, right? Right, really like you know, playing the Politburo, like let's call it Politburo politic, right? He has that side to him. But but you know, I don't know how much you have heard about, but I've talked to some very well-informed journalists in Davao who are not fan of Duterte at all, and they were saying, actually. He would read a lot. So, I don't know, probably he read about Stalin. Probably he read about Marcos. I mean, his father worked with Marcos, although in a junior cabinet position. So, But you're right. It's also instinct. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's an instinctive Hobbesian figure, oh. right? It's, it's just comes... But he's also a well-read guy, at least from what we know in his younger years, which unfortunately was not reflected in his prose later oh. in life. He well, actually, well. nakikita mo pa rin, di ba, yung si Duterte sometimes at his Ay, best moment. Poetic, moments. ano siya. Oh. Pag naging English siya, he speaks a very taught, classical yeah, English. Exactly. Parang, parang galing 1950s na archaic, wala ganun pa sakali. At his best moments, ha. Meron siya. Meron. De, kaya nga, my, 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 my concern was not uh, lack of education, illiteracy for me was more like he's not just at his sharp. Exactly. Like, yeah, just feeling wow. the guy. We're just being nice wow. here, right? Yeah, Pero so my mom is siya na lumalabas yung old Duterte, di ba? Imagine ko yung reading habits. Siguro para siyang tito magbasa. Alam mo na ang tito yung parang very macho, yung parang they read military history, they read diplomatic <laughs> history. Ano <laughs> man? So, so, diba, Grabe parang, ka naman, tito. Diba, <laughs> macho tito. Sa tingin, ko, sa tingin ko, ganun magbasa. So so maybe through that reading, he was able yeah. to kind Probably of... Probably has a them. whole section like... Stalin, you know, Franco, you know, it's like just just oh, learn oh. from all of these guys. What are the my dictator's place playbook ano siya, section siya, no? He will read from them and just like he'll just skim through, go to the exciting point. Ayan, tama yan. Ganon, dapat pare ito. Tita ka, tita ano bro, tawagin niya yung ano. Ito ito ito. Bongo, ito ito basta tama tong ginawa niya, di ba? Ito nga. I think you're right. Basay mo. I think meron siyang if Tito reading, I think it's like that. Ito nga, ito nga. Kaya siya. 
Lah yan ganyan siya sa page, sa page. Ito, ito basahin mo daw. Ito laway-laway na para mabalikan mo. So, yeah. I mean, I have never I have never witnessed a Philippine president. <laughs> Uh, Said Idi Amin. <laughs> Di ba? I mean, oh, si Duterte is like the only president I've ever heard. Probably watched the movie. Idi Last Amin. King of Scotland ba yan? Last King of Scotland. Was that the movie? Kay, ano? Di ba yung Last King of Scotland? Or yeah, like oh. the Idi Amin one really like what? Where is this movie? <laughs> oh my goodness. Like, we shouldn't even love. It's so bad. But oh. he has this moment of curveballs, no? Intellectual oh. curveballs, I call it. Like, Wait, what? It's like, where is this coming from, right? Diba? I, I, he's, I think, the most complex character in 20th century early 21st century. Like, no one comes close to the guy. I'm still, I mean, as as Walden puts it best, he's politically, uh, he's a political horror story, but sociologically fascinating, right? Mm, I mean, tuloy pa rin ang Duterte studies. Yeah, yeah, tuloy pa rin. Kaya sabi ko kanina sa class ko, sabi ko, Thanks to Leloy, uh, we realized that Philippine Studies has already a subsection called Duterte Studies, right? I think that's what si Tihanke is the first one who said Duterte. Ay, Tihanke. Oh, yeah. Let's give credit also to Dean, Dean Tihanke on that, no? But of course, with Marcos's back, it's it's not uh, the most prominent now. The Marcoses are still going to dominate the Philippine Studies, no? So, speaking of that, Digo, like, what do you think about it? Because, uh, I mean, obviously, people are. Made, I've written so much on this, it's, and I've said a lot. But but I want to take your point of view as a historian because, ganito, like one argument in favor of Duterte would be uh, almost Freudian Lacanian, which is he was the rupture that we needed to reset our relationship with the U.S. in the best way possible. Right? This is the more generous account. Like as crazy as Duterte was, in order for the Philippines to have a more mature relationship with the U.S., you needed that. Electroshock, right? So he all uh, you, you know what I'm saying, you know the role of rupture in, in psychological <laughs> developmental psychology, right? Kind of Lacanian. But the other one, which is also my point of view, is like, okay, I see this need for the shock, but not this kind of shock. Like this was totally bara bara shock, right? It's like the electrocution before to help people with I don't know schizophrenia or whatever. So sabi mo nga Richard, sabi mo Richard sa podcast mo about Edka, di ba? Na right na empower talaga ni Duterte at the expense of really emboldening the Chinese kasi ang duwag ng approach so feel nila kung gusto lang sumalakay sa salakay sila and uh, I wanted to ask you like ano yung long term effect noon nung of emboldening the Chinese at that time like have we lost anything permanently as a result of that Well I think good friends like Paul Bakal have written a lot on for instance the effect on fishery stock You know, like mm-hmm. we lost a lot of fishery stock. And then we have friends in the UP Marine Science who have done very authoritative studies that shows we're losing $600 million dollars a year to China due to ecological damage, environmental damage. So no one is accounting that. We have been, so six years of Duterte, barely anything done at the level of the president. Uh, so we have lost billions of dollars in fishery resources ecological damage and all. So I can give you exactly the numbers, diba? Easily we can say... And then, uh, no, utang ba ta? And then ano ba? Tumaas yung utang natin sa China? Uh, that's where I, I'm glad that I was correct because, diba, sabi ko, pledge trap, hindi dead trap. Uh, pledge China. trap. Oh. Which in a way is worse, diba? <laughs> Kasi walang dumating pero nag-concede pa rin tayo ng geopolitical, ano, diba? So hmm. that's for me, in a way, is even worse than dead trap. Maybe an economist would disagree with me. Uh, I mean, First of all, let me give credit to folks at NEDA, uh, Padranga, uh, not Padranga, uh, Pernia, right? I think Secretary Pernia could do to you. I think he did a very good job of blocking a lot of dodgy Chinese projects. Could do so to friends in Marawi, because I was also in Marawi in 2019, who 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 lobbied against you know the Chinese plan of reconstructing Marawi. I mean, you don't want to give you know these areas. You know, we saw what they did in Xinjiang, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, no, there were um and and so so. In fairness, there were a lot of dodgy things that were blocked. So I came out correct in a sense that I was saying, no, no, the, the, the left and opposition is a little bit too paranoid about this. Not much money will come in. And that was based on my study of China's patterns of investment in Africa and Middle East. They'll promise 100 billion, 5 billion comes after 20 years, and then it's mostly dodgy investment, poor workers in China, etc. So that was really the context of my discussion. So going back to this, I think Duterte has done a lot of damage to our interest in the West Philippines and all. But the not only the uh, patriot, but the analyst in me still says, "Leloy, no, hindi huling lahat." 
I think if the current president plays the card well, which is what we're going to discuss next, which is Marcos Jr., interestingly, um, we still can reverse some of the damage. Kumbaga, think of it. If 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 boxing is 12 rounds, round 7, 8 na tayo, thanks dun sa kapalpakan ni Duterte, we got two knockdowns that we didn't have to get. So you're not mm. anymore at... So if we avoided those two knockdowns, we could have done better now, right? In the eighth round. Sorry, I'm using the boxing, but all, both of us into M, uh, sports and into martial arts. So the, the two knockdowns are going to affect your long-term career, but also your performance in the last six rounds. But the no two knockdowns were not strong enough to end the game, right? Because we can get some boost, steroid boost almost in the break time. And that's where alliances come in. That's where alliances come in. So that's why my sense is I don't want to downplay the damage that the Duterte did, but I don't believe in strategic fatalism. I believe at the end of the day, we still didn't lose any territory to China in the West Philippine Sea under Duterte, but we gave the Chinese the impression that they can get away with, with a lot. And that's why binibuli tayo ng ganito. That's why I kind of got into trouble, Lele. Of course, you may know or not, the, 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 over the other day, um, syempre, I'm back. I'm thinking about Philippines, etc. I'm a little bit emotional. And then I see the president summons the Chinese ambassador and expresses mm -hmm. his intent. And of course, this is just after the Etka decision and all of that. No, So I just felt, wow, finally, well, finally we have someone who kind of... Netua, netua, netua. And I was happy. I just said the word kudos to BBM and all. So obviously some of our friends or not really friends, some of my haters... Try to use that to portray me as a oh I thought I either a pro anak ng dictator or pro US and all, so that is really where. But for me, kanina actually I just this is my column. I said if it takes uh it takes a Nixon to go to China, right? You can also say in a way it takes a Marcos Jr. to correct Duterte's mistake without a major backlash. Because my yeah. understanding, Lele, tell me what how you think. Dilaw yon kung dilaw yon maguguhitan ka agad. Lenny yan gumawa ng correction nyan. Ay nako the attack will be very vicious, right? But because BBM did it, ipit bigla. Ipit yung kalaban eh. Sobrang isolated. Sino ba? Si Kiboloy lang at saka SMN9 and others are attacking, di ba? I kind of, I mean, but but not really... Change the French DDS na lang yung nakakata. Yeah, sobrang ano, wala. Si, ano, si Sasot na lang. Mga gana. You know what I'm saying? Like, wala eh. So, but if Lenny did that, iba yung dynamics eh. Iba yung... So, in a way, Marcos was, I hate to say it, he made That's very it very super That's very corrected. You know, I again, so it's a kind of an it takes a Nixon to, to go to China. It's, it takes a Marcus Jr. to correct Duterte's mistake. So so again, I'll be very clear. And it I takes believe... and it takes a Richard D. Daria na hindi nakaguhit sa mga divisions sa Pilipinas to make an observation like that because and get it's, not about, yeah. it's not about our camp, you know, That's ultimately about national interest. You know, for democracy, we don't like Pagnanakao ni Marcos. But really, this is better. I mean, this is better foreign policy than than Duterte. Like I challenge anyone to like make an argument that this is worse foreign policy than Duterte. Like it's it's a really difficult argument to make unless you're just some kind of knee-jerk anti-American na lahat ng ginawa ng America is 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 bad. And I understand there is a generation of Filipinos na ganyan and there's a subset of the Filipinos na ganyan na nagde-default na lang to everything that the United States does is bad and 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 you know we should be completely independent from the US. But I mean even think about Edgar for example. I mean mm. we have experts on Mindanao who will say na EDCA has been good for Mindanao, unfortunately. Because even if there's a history of American violence in Mindanao, totoo nga yun. You mean VFA? You mean VFA? In the 20th century, sorry, sino ba ang pumapatay ng Mindanao? In the 20th century, sino ba ang pumapatay ng Mindanao? Sino ba ang nag-all-out war sa Mindanao noong 2000? Amerikano ba o si Erap? Sino ba ang sumira ng Marawi? Uh, Americano ba or si, or si Duterte so for a lot of our so according to the field work uh, of, I see what you're saying so the Americans are the reasonable he, counterparts it's the, oh, the he, he's, in, he's in fact saying that relative to the violence of the Philippine military it's the US military na nagiging bara dun sa and sometimes it's actual you know it's actual physical bara like wag niyong patayin niya mga yan dahil nandun yung mga Americano so so you know like the work of Abinales is, is controversial in that sense yeah, but if you yeah, look at yeah. the data lalo na nung height ng yeah. VFA lalo nung time ni Arroyo like ang assumption, natin, ground, ang assumption so. natin sa Manila was that the Moros and that Mindanao would reject American presence? That's not what the data showed. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's true. I agree. That's 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 a bit controversial to say, maybe, but 
on the ground that's also what exactly what they get but it takes an abinales to say that <laughs> oh nakakatakot sabihin di ba oh na si abinales i cannot do it i have already a lot on my on my show i really like what you said so what do you feel now i mean remember you said something like dalawang nakakatakot kay marcos junior he fails and the, and then he becomes a dictator whatever and then the other one he doesn't become dictator and doesn't do too bad and actually do some good things Like uh, it looks like we were in level we were like in the latter uh, scenario now, right? Like, how do you feel as someone is critical of, of course, the horrors of the martial law and and all sure, the no. shenanigans of you know? I mean, yeah. Yeah, and then you know the nice thing about about being within the ambit of the U.S. and not within the ambit of China is, especially with a democratic president, you have a partner who will actually care about your human rights record, right? And right. That's good because that will prevent another backsliding into Dutertismo. I mean, one of the reasons why Duterte was able to get away with human rights violations was because he intentionally isolated the Philippines from global partners who would have been able to say something about it, right? And now that we're we're back in that fold, it's a kind of not it's not a guarantee, but it's a guard against that kind of behavior. But if you want to change the community, you can't just kill patay. Ng patay. Yeah. Uh, so okay, maybe we'll end on this one. Bagla humaba tong episode, but it is because America is such a big shadow over us, no? Um where do you go where do you see our relations with America is going? I mean, the Santis, if what if the Santis is the next president? How do you see this going? I mean, if it's not another Biden administration because Biden so far has been very reasonable, very You know, I, I you know, like I I sometimes wonder how do democrat democratic Filipino Americans who hate the Marcoses feel about Biden going, you know, the extra mile really, right? To really charm Marcos. I mean, for me, uh, there are three factors that explain this interesting turn of events, right? One is China is not giving us much, which we'll discuss in a different episode. The second is how Biden and the whole administration has been all over the place trying to charm Marcos. And I think that really softens like, wow, Pwede ba ang Secretary of State? Numating yeah. ang Secretary of Defense? Numating ang Vice President? Vice President. Diba? I mean, come on, man. He's, and then, like, they're inviting him in April. It could be a state visit. I mean, like, uh, and then in Europe, they're taking care of him. Parang, yung sabi, parang kunyan, parang Biden, Uy, alagaan yan, ano natin yan. Sige, sige, kami bahala dito sa Davos. Like, you can almost see it, right? I mean, like, and if you're Marcos Jr., right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I want to make life easier for the next generation, This is my best chance for global rehabilitation project, right? If this is a rebranding project, this is the best you can get. So, of course, we can have very weird feelings about it. But geopolitically, I think that explains why Mark... Because honestly, Lele, I was thinking this EDCA issue will be finalized in April. Nangyari na kaagad. So, parang, wow, excited yata si Marcos Jr. Like, let's go for it, no? So, so like, wow, this is this is crazy, bro. I mean, this is really crazy. Right. Even yeah. uh, even if I kind of saw, I I not I really saw this coming. If you look at all my writings in last year, this is even faster than I thought. So like the charm offensive of Biden is incredible. If you look at it in a certain way, uh, whether I I like it or not, I'm just talking about the effect it's having. Right. I mean, how do you feel? You're 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 based in America. Like, how do you feel about Biden doing this, going all over the like, Marcos Jr. will take care of you. Like, what do you feel about it? Sa akin, okay lang kung pro-protectan tayo from China eh. Parang, parang sa akin ganun. Kasi, kasi mm-hmm. there, there are two ways to think about it. It's like, if kung gusto nyo personal eh, nasabihin nyo, it is Biden, the democratic president, courting the son of a dictator. But actually, let's abstract it a little bit. It is actually the United States reactivating a security pledge to the Philippines. That was always there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Diba? Parang, and, and, and that is comforting for Filipinos because China is a real threat. And I mean, You mentioned this earlier in the episode, Richard. I mean, sige, like we've established quite firmly that America is an imperialist state. We did that in this episode, right. but it's an imperialist state that that has that that is a democracy that can correct that can self correct through elections. And we that can is not through through that we can influence, lobbying. Yeah, exactly. And 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 our Filipino Americans who are here, de ba? And even you know, if you think about the U.S. military, and I mean Filipino chan sa U.S. military, I, I was speaking actually to a to a soldier na Filipino. Sabi niya, maniwala ka sa akin pare. Kung ano kung genera tayo ng China, this all of the Filipino Americans and Filipinos yeah. in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, sa yeah, Pilipinos, I'm telling you, bro. Yeah, 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 I'm telling you, bro.
Exactly. I mean, just look at Ukraine, bro. Ukraine has no alliance whatsoever with the U.S. Ukraine has is not part of NATO. Ukraine was has very thin ties with the West compared to what the Philippines. And yet, look at how much support Ukraine is getting. And when Ukraine showed courage, they went all in. Taiwan doesn't have even formal bilateral relationship with the U.S. And yet they're doing everything to prepare Taiwan, uh, to protect Taiwan against and China. And then sa mo, iwan lang nila yung Pilipinas. Can you imagine the political crisis that will create in the Philippines if they just abandon the Philippines? And what do you think other U.S. allies will do? Oh, uh, uh, lang pala eh. So it's not about the Philippines per se. It's a damage it will do domestically uh, and globally. So this, I'll put it this way. America cannot afford to abandon the Philippines yeah. from the power. As simple as that. That's my argument based on every research and every conversation okay. I'm having with everyone who matters and know what they're talking about. So there are two ways, I think, to read nga, this history of the violence of imperialism in the Philippine-American War. One is to say na, dahil ginera tayo, dahil dami pinatay na Pilipino, we should have nothing to do with them ever again. Yeah, they're they're evil. so evil and whatever. Listen, that line of argument, right? Yeah. The other way yeah. is, Tangin na nyo, gineran nyo kami, may utang kayo sa amin ngayon. Protect yeah. Bumawi kayo, di ba? This is your time, di ba? Bumawi oh. kayo. Which is one oh. we've got. Yeah, this is your payback time, you know, for for oh. all of the nasty... Yeah. Tulungan nyo kami ngayon, di ba? Oh. And, and, yeah, that's... And, of course, we'll have another discussion on this because we have to talk about the Eastern powers, no? Because this is not just US and Philippines. The term there, guys, is integrated deterrence. So, kasama automatically mga Hapon dito at mga Australiano, right? Yes. For me, this yes. is a real quad. Not the one with India and all. We know what India plays. Yes. But this is the real quote. Philippines, Japan, Australia, US. This is the future, guys. And, and it's formidable. Of history, Marcos Jr. is making the big decisions of moving us in that direction. You know who it's told us that the real quad? You can guess who are which countries. They told us. They, one day, we were. I was talking to some of these diplomats and friends from some of these Alec. They said, you know what? We need our own real quad. You know, the quad of really us. And this was Duterte time. And I said, don't count out the Philippines. We might still come back. And like what now, wow. Like now I'm I'm everyone is reading me abroad, bro. Like this is what people don't appreciate. My Twitter followers, huge majority of them, at least the verified ones I can see, are diplomats all around the world. So what when I write about the, handle, the Philippines, yeah. bro, it influences their strategic decision making. It's the fact. I could see literally ambassadors, policymakers in many allied countries. They're saying, oh, see, hey, Darian, hey, Darian, no, hindi naman pro Marcos yan. Diba? Alam mo yun, eh. If hey, Darian is saying, it's probably there's something big happening here, right? So I feel responsible almost, right? Parang, hmm. Diba? I, it's, it's almost like when Adam Tuz was saying he was surprised at how his words are taken by the markets and investors. I kind of sometimes feel like that. I mean, without feeling too important and all. This, is a, this, is, this was a fascinating discussion, bro. I actually realized there's so much more we can discuss. And to summarize, I would say there are at least four ways by which the Philippines has been instrumental to the birth of or to the birth of many aspects or pillars of America's global hegemonic uh, you know, project, right? The neocon aspect, the Manafort aspect and Trumpism, right? The aspect of counterinsurgency. And I didn't know this, bro. I didn't know this. The Philippines was also at the forefront of the hegemonic transition at this financial between U.S. and uh, United Kingdom. That's very fascinating. I think historians will love it. So Philippines is very central to global history in ways I don't think we Filipinos appreciate. Yeah, That's why I love this conversation, bro, because we're making Philippines a global history. Kaya nga nexus, di ba? This interstices, yeah. exactly, this interstices, this, all of these uh, tendons, no? These ligaments and tendons that really connect us to major changes in the world. I'm just surprised... It's not as much emphasis. I, of course, there has been a lot of academic literature on that, but it never percolated into, uh, let's say, more mainstream discussion. Not that we're mainstream per se, but I, I hope this will be the beginning of a big project. I, I'm fascinated by your book. I'm already thinking of a book, as I said, the title is something like The Secret History of the Philippines, right? And I'm thinking about a lot of okay. crazy things I can put there, right? Um, so I really appreciate this discussion. Now, uh, let's end this episode because I want us to talk about the two other important actors, maybe not as long as what we had with US. I think it's about na tayong pareho. But I think they're also very important to the future of the Philippines. And obviously, this is China and Japan. Thank you so, so much, bro. I look forward to our next episode on those ones. Salamat. Salamat. Salamat.